Hello, I'm Eri Seden and this is Short Story Monday. I publish one short story every Monday, so don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to stay tuned. Morgan waited until the rest of the girls have left so she could shower alone. While she pretended to shuffle around her locker, other girls left the showers, giggling and whispering behind her back. She filled their gazes. Too freakish pale, one of them said louder, and some snorted, others ignored, like a skeleton. Morgan scurried into the empty showers and dropped her towel only after they left, talking to each other about stupid things she didn't care about. She washed, dried up, and returned to her locker, only to find it empty. She heard her classmates laughing from the hallway. She blinked away hot, angry tears in her eyes. At least she had a towel. For a brief moment, she contemplated calling her mom, but she didn't want to disturb her during her work. She approached the doors, draped in a towel, and peeked out. C can I get my clothes back, please? She tried to sound polite, but her words came out choked. Why don't you get them yourself? suggested Amanda, the blonde, mean girl, the top cheerleader, her main tormentor. They are your clothes? Where? She forced herself to ask and hope they wouldn't notice her eyes gleaming with tears. Another girl from the cheerleading squad pointed at the roof outside and girls giggled. She will cry, she scoffed and they laughed harder. She will need to drop that towel to get on the roof, one of the boys sneered in anticipation. Instead of doing what they wanted, she shut herself back in the changing room. She will miss her next class for sure. Nothing unusual. She didn't have spare clothes, but at least they will leave and she will retrieve the clothes from the roof. There were classroom windows on either side of it, in one of which they were all supposed to have their next class. Never mind, we will see her anyway. That was Amanda's voice from the hallway. Let's go, people. The sound of their footsteps indicated they left. Relieved, as she remained on her own, she peeked back outside. Two boys stayed behind. Brian and Jackson took a hold of the door, shoved her back in, and shut the doors behind. She remained trapped with two buff football players and with no real clothes on her. Mischievous smirk played on their faces, a predatory glint in their eyes. Who will go first? Brian wondered as he approached her. Doesn't, does it matter? She's a slut. Jackson grinned wide. She'd be hot if she wouldn't be so palish. Warm her up for me, will ya? No, please don't, she managed as she moved away from them towards the corner. But as boys descended towards her, and despite her struggles, janked the tower off her body, she screamed. Help! 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 She cried, hysteria creeping in her voice, her face hot with tears and shame. Aware of their rough hands grabbing, touching her, then laughing, and then one of them pushed her. She hit her head on the edge of the sink and blacked out. She woke up alone, wrapped in the blanket inside the counselor's office. Her clothes sat on the chair next to the small couch. She remembered boys threatening her with rape in the bathroom and checked her tights. Nothing, all dry. Everything as usual down there. Nothing sticky or bloody, nothing hurt, just as most of the time. She put on her plain white underwear and bra, followed by a long sleeved black shirt and jeans, slid in her black converse and picked up her bag. She took a glimpse into a small mirror on the wall above the sink. They bruised her pale face red and purple on the side and she was feeling a numb pain spreading in the area. It looked nasty. She pulled some hair up front to cover it. That will need some foundation. A light knock on the door startled her and the counselor came in. Middle-aged, chubby woman with short blonde curls and glasses was also Amanda's aunt, Karen Hawthorne. You are awake, she noted. We found you in the girls' locker room. You must have slipped and fell. I called for help, she remembered. I believe you fainted before that, 
Mrs. Hawthorne explained. Two nice boys found you and brought you the clothes you threw on the roof. Oh, she managed. Which two? Jackson Connor and Brian Carlson, she replied. Morgan shuddered. They tried to. She was unable to even say it. Her stomach twisted all over again. Are you all right? Mr. Connor and Mr. Carlson expressed concern about your behavior. They said you threw your clothes on the roof in a fit. They suggested you might be unwell. I... I didn't... They... They found you and called for help. What would we do without such a model students in our school? They come from a good family involved in our school board. She forced a smile as she flipped through the, her file. Morgan, I tried to get you into counseling for your mother's request. Your grades have been dropping. You have done damage to the lab. Not me. The other girls. Don't interrupt me. It's always others' fault, isn't it? Several witnesses told on you. To top the pile, you've skipped few classes, ruined your books, you ignore everyone, and now this? She shook her head, not to mention how you started off on the wrong foot, insulting Amanda for being a traditional and moral girl. I... Unsure of what to say, her words got choked on the bile racing in her throat. Skylar and Caroline ripped her books. Madeline and Charlotte damaged the lab. Brian and Jackson forced her out of the class. And she never insulted Amanda. She just mentioned how she found virginity promises to the dads creepy. And thought nothing of it afterwards. But that had started her torment. If someone talked to her after that, they would shun them. Her bullies under Amanda's lead were the reason she had no friends. They attempted to. They. She was unable to even think of it. I would say you suffer from depression. Maybe you should seek therapy. I will talk to your mother about it. Karen rambled on. I don't need a therapist, she protested. She needed for her bullies to leave her alone. You need help. The way you are now makes me question whether there might be something worse going on with you. She made a pregnant pause and her gaze drilled into her. Do you do drugs? What? She managed, baffled. No, n no, I don't. I don't do drugs. I'm being bullied. Bullied? Karen clicked her tongue. By whom? The girls from the class who tried to be your friends? just came by twenty minutes ago, expressing their concerns about you. They all tried to help you. Morgan swallowed and grabbed her bag. This led nowhere. I'm leaving. Your next class starts in five minutes, old bitch called after her. Make sure you come, come by this week so we can talk. Morgan wanted to flip her a bird, but that would only lead her to bigger trouble. Getting expelled was not an option. It was the only high school in the area, and her mom worked hard to provide for both of them. She had a while to go before finishing the school. She just turned 16, which meant two more years of pure hell. The whole ordeal started a few months ago with gossip, ostracism, random exclusions. She became a slut who didn't know how to do the makeup and dressed poorly. Morgan always wore the same style of clothes, a dark shirt, jeans, and converse shoes. A jacket when colder, along with a black eyeliner. She had a pale face, but liked it. Her mom would always tell her how beautiful she is, and never allowed her to consume girly magazines. She had her black hair down to her mid-back, haunted with her thick, healthy look. Chestnut eyes, straight nose. She always thought of herself as pretty. Yet those girls with colored hair and fake tans, tons of makeup, dressing in the girliest fashion possible, had a special way to make her feel adequate. Not that she wanted to be like them, she only wanted to be left the hell alone. Instead, she received prank calls from hidden numbers and disgusting emails from fake accounts. Boys probably wrote those. Jackson, Brian, Cooper, Caden. She tolerated all the injustices against her, even when her property got destroyed, even when they spread false information about her to teachers. But today, they attempted to rape her. They assaulted her. She remembered their hands on her. Rough male hands. If she wouldn't black out, 
who knows they got a kick out of her pain and suffering that's why they did it once she blacked out they lost interest but they saw her exposed naked she shuddered at the thought no one ever saw her naked but her mom and dad and even that as a toddler when they changed her diapers and gave her baths she didn't want to concern her parents with her problems her mom worked most of the time trying to keep together make ends meet pay the bills make sure they had all the necessities she wouldn't know what to do her dad few weeks passed since she talked to him and she wasn't able to do it daily she contemplated what to do on her way home the walk to their small apartment took her only 40 minutes. The town was small, with only about 15,000 people. She couldn't talk to her mom. She had no one else. And new as newbies in town, they tried to make a better life for themselves. Instead, her life worsened. Back in the city, she had friends. Now she had shunners and bullies. She hated small, backward towns. Nice people went at their churches and feral if you didn't meet their standards. Just before she got in, she checked for the mail. She received a letter from her dad. She smiled to herself. She missed her father more than she could say with the words. One letter for her, one for mom, both crammed in the same envelope. She took the one addressed to her and put the other on the table for her mom. She fell on her bed as and read it. My little bun, life inside is dull as ever, but I get to work out, keep in shape, make friends with my fellow inmates now i am studying in the library by the time i get out i may have a law degree going he drew a wink emoji at the end of the sentence how are you doing in your new school do you have any friends you never say anything if there is something wrong be sure to tell me i will give them hell that made her smile unsure whether she should share her problems what would he do from the inside but worry Call me any time. Visit me. It has been a while. I miss you very much. Love, Dad. Yeah, it has been a while. Her mom had been sick for a few weeks, and then she had to work to bring the money in. Morgan wasn't allowed to go by herself. It has been two months, but they would go tomorrow. They were both healthy, and Mom rambled about it for the whole week. We are going, and I will bake him a cake. His birthday is coming up, she told her as she howled the gro groceries in. And the moment she got home and out of her work clothes, that is what she did. Morgan joined her and noticed her concern. Morgan, what's that nasty bruise? What happened? I uh, slipped in the locker room and hit myself, she lied. Mom grimaced, furrowing her brows. Why don't I believe you? We'll have to talk, missy. Some other day I want to focus on the cake for dad. She dismissed her and pulled out the recipe. Next day, they presented the cake to her dad, who offered it to other convicts in the visitor's room. Her dad was a popular guy who had a way of making friends, even with hardened criminals that surrounded him. He excelled at solving problems and used to be a great manager until they caught him at some fraud. Two more years of this place and he would be eligible for parole. After, after the initial hugs and kisses and catching up, her mom took a few minutes on her own with her dad. She stepped away to get them some discretion. She looked at how they embraced and just held each other. She found it beautiful. Her parents always loving each other and having each other's backs. It made her smile. She only wished for something like that. She noticed how a guy in an orange jumpsuit got brought in. She recognized her father's cellmate, a handsome guy in his twenties, his locks dirty blonde and eyes green, and he had a nice goatee to compliment his square jaw. Her secret crush, although she only knew his name, Sawyer. She always thought of it as a sexy name, Sawyer Hunter. She scolded herself. She had no time for this now. She came to see her dad, not to admire the muscles of Sawyer's arms or his stoned body under that prison jumpsuit. However, Sawyer saw her, shot her a smile and waved at her from the other side of the room. She waved back at him, bit her lip, blushed bright red and turned away. Feeling super embarrassed, she barely managed to cool off when her mom approached her.
Would you like to talk to your dad alone? She asked, her eyes gleamed with concern. They must have been aware of her situation. She had no friends, seemed miserable and her face a mess. She nodded and went to the corner table to her dad. He took her hands in his and shot her that look that said he will believe everything she says. I will keep it a secret from you, mum. I know you don't want her to worry, he whispered. Unable to hold it in any longer, everything spilled out of her. The exclusions, the rumors, the harassment, the humiliation. And last, she told him of what almost happened the day before, and what the counselor said to her. I'm so scared, Dad. I knew nobody cares about me. I have no friends. If I say something to an adult, they will dismiss me or flat out ignore me. I'm afraid of going back to the school. I'm so afraid. He held her close and it made her feel safe. Going back to the school, going back to the gym class made her stomach twist with discomfort. They'd pick on her. They may even do what they failed to do yesterday. She sobbed in his chest and he just held her. There, there, my little bun. I will see what I can do. He whispered to her. The underlying fury in his voice was impossible to miss. Don't make mom worry, all right? If you don't feel like going to the school, fake being sick, I approve. He winked at her, trying to comfort her. It worked for now. She smiled as he kissed her forehead. Once they left, her mother didn't ask questions. She held her hand to comfort her. Everything will be all right, honey. She sounded so reassuring. She only nodded as she observed through the window how countryside rolled by. She told her dad everything and now she only made him worry. How selfish was she? She should have gone to the therapist in town. Or to the police. Not that any of it would help. She had nothing but her word against the words of the most popular people in the school and the school board filled with their relatives and family friends. From then on, she kept avoiding the bully clique, as she named them. Not that it did her any good, they still drenched her bag with milk and ruined all of her notes. They broke into her locker, damaging the lock and then blaming on her. Someone threw her converse into a dirty toilet while she showered. Ever since two boys saw her naked, they spread all sorts of nasty things about her. She has herpes and doesn't shave. Nasty comments made her sick to the stomach. Another one hit even lower. She's doing it with a janitor while she's skipping class. How disgusting could they get? Three weeks later, she realized her bullies followed her on her way home. All by herself, she crossed the park at her usual pace until she heard Amanda say, Go get her, boys. Give us a show. She broke off into a run. She never ran faster in her life and cursed over picking her usual way home. She'd never guess they skipped their practice to follow her. She looked back, the boys have gotten close, too close for her liking, and then they caught up with her. She screamed and screamed. They pulled at her clothes and snickered, and the girls laughed and flashed their phones. And she screamed and cried, and they pulled her hair and hurt her. They reduced her to the whimpering mess and left her on the cold ground, her clothes torn and body bruised. She vomited the bile from her throat, and as she picked herself up, she made a silent promise. They messed with the wrong person. She won't let them get away with it.